Hello, my name is Armin. I'm working for a company called Rantastic. Maybe a few words about uh, what, what is Rantastic, what are we doing? We're basically providing services for people doing sports. So when you want to go out for a run or you want to do, uh, then you can track it or you want to do strength training, then, you, then we have apps for that. Or there's even now apps about nutrition. So if you want to eat healthy, then you can do that with our apps and we support you here. Um, it's, uh, it's smartphone apps, but there is a big uh, need for backend services. And I'm in a team uh, that runs this backend infrastructure. And so maybe a few words about the infrastructure. What are we doing? What's, what's, what's there? What does it uh, consist of? Um, Basically, we have uh, uh, most of the things we are running is uh, running on Ubuntu Linux. Uh, we have a network, a software defined network. I will come back to that a little bit later uh, from Cisco. We use Chef for uh, configuring and installing software on our virtual machines and also on our physical machines. And we use Terraform also as a tool to uh, a little bit uh, tie together all the different pieces in our infrastructure. Um, then we come to the part that's maybe most interesting for you as, uh, as you're attending the Open Nebula conference. We have uh, a lot of virtualization, so most of the machines that we run, run virtually. There is only a very little one, very little part of the infrastructure that runs on physical machines. Uh, we use Linux, KVM, Open Nebula, we have around, and that's only the productive infrastructure. We also have an infrastructure for development and office uh, purposes. Uh, but in productive infrastructure, we have around 3,600 CPU cores, 20 terabyte of memory, and around roughly 100 terabyte of, of storage space. Um, then we have, and I said that before, we have some physical machines. That's our core databases, which are some kind of legacy. Uh, legacy because we actually started uh, doing a little bit more of a microservice approach that would say that you have a service and every service has its own dedicated databases. Uh, but for legacy reasons, we are also quite an old company. We had our eighth birthday like two weeks ago, I think, or one week ago. Um, so there is some, some uh, uh, quite a big MySQL cluster. We have a very, very big Cassandra cluster with 64 physical nodes. And we have MongoDB, which we run as, physical, as virtual machines, but we have dedicated physical disks for, for each shard. So it's a different topic. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can talk to me later. So what are we doing? We have uh, roughly 30 to 35 back-end services. So a service is more or less like a feature that we provide to the apps. And every service uh, consists of different parts. Can be databases, uh, from, uh, a web service that do synchronous requests. We have service that do asynchronous jobs and a lot of other things like caching. So we really use a lot of technologies. Most of those technologies are like 99% are open source technologies. Um, you, you see a little bit of, uh, uh, of what we're using, MySQL, Redis, MongoDB, Nginx, uh, AJ Proxy, a lot of different stuff. Um, so my team, and we are eight people in, in the team, my team is responsible for the complete stack that you see here from the hardware, say network hardware, server hardware, up to the databases and the stack where then in the end the developer would deploy its code to. So that's, that's our responsibility. So we have a lot of things that we need to, that we need to cover uh, and we are not that many people to cover that. And that's why we, we are investing a lot of <coughs> our brain in making that easier for us. So, That was, that was also the point, like we were starting with Open Nebula quite some time ago and we had a quite classic setup. Uh, so we had like virtualization holes and we had a, uh, here. We had a classic network with data center switches and they were managed by hand as you would manage switches and 
It was even that we outsourced the management of the data center switches because we said we are, um, we are system administrators, no network administrators. We don't know too much about networking, so we don't dare to do it on our own. So we had an external partner that did the management. Uh, we had computing, Open Nebula. We use it since five years. Works flawlessly for us since then. Uh, we were very happy with it. Uh, then we had an enterprise storage from, in that case, NetApp. Worked perfect, but there's some downsides in a setup like this. It's very classic NFS. and um, There's some problems because there's a lot of manual steps, as you can imagine. So you have a network that is managed by an outsourced partner. You have to tell this partner what he should configure on the specific port. Um, you have to configure the NetApp, the whatever you need there. It's also manual because it's an enterprise thing. It's a proprietary uh, solution. Uh, and then you have a lot, of, um, a lot of things to consider when you create a new service. Then an additional thing is that you have a lot of scaling effort. Because you, if you, you can imagine if you have a, an enterprise storage and this enterprise storage is not big enough, then you would add maybe a disk shelf. But at a certain point, there is an end. It's a scale-up thingy, so it will not be faster to for forever, and you cannot scale it forever. And it's also another thing. Maybe some of you know this. You have uh, you want to add two or three new KVM hosts, but you know, okay, now the storage is already at the limits, so we will also need a new storage. Then you tell your <laughs> boss that for the three new KVM hosts that you want to add, you also need a new enterprise storage. And the enterprise storage is basically then not 10K or something, but it's maybe 60, 70, 80, whatever K. And then he will ask you if you're an idiot. Uh, and at least you have a lot of discussions on that. Um, and then there was one thing that was the, uh, I, would, I, I thought about how to say this. There's a problematic config handover between those systems because there's nothing that ties the three systems that we have here together. So you configure a VLAN on the network and you have to do the same in Open Nebula, but there's a lot of errors that can happen in that because you just do a typo and then it's wrong, basically. So we said we have to change something here. And um, so we decided to go the buzzword way. I also wrote in the little uh, teaser about my, my talk uh, about um, about the buzzword. Um, so the question is, what is hyperconverged infrastructure? Is it only a buzzword that we use only to sell stuff, or is there more behind it? Because if you think back, well, all of you that are longer in that job know that like 10, 15 years ago, we already had servers that had disks inside and that did virtualization. So what's the new thing on it? Um, the question is, or the difference is maybe, or I looked up on Wikipedia what the definition of hyperconverged infrastructure is. And Wikipedia says something like it virtualizes at least the network part, the computing part, and the storage part. So as soon as you have these three things uh, virtualized, meaning you can configure it via a central interface, then you're speaking of hyperconverged infrastructure. OK, um, sounds interesting. Um, and then we come to the second point that was the thing that we liked most about it. That was we wanted to have one interface to configure all the parts. So one single source of truth for your configuration, not having uh, a storage guy doing storage stuff, a network guy doing network stuff. And if you want to know what, what the, the, the state is, then you need to ask all of them. You know? uh, but having one information source for that. And then there was another point that's very important for us. I don't know how it is for you, but uh, we don't scale in like one time a year. Then we add some servers and then we're happy for the next year. We scale whenever it's necessary. So we say we have a need of 5%, 10% more resources, then we buy servers for that. And so what we want to do is we want to buy some servers, add them and scale the system and then it's fine. We don't want to think about do I need a little bit more storage now as well or whatever else. So we were trying to find the pieces for the thing, and actually it was not, was, was not that difficult to do. So the first thing was uh, networking. Um, the, the good thing is, if you want to do that, you just have to look for these three letters. It starts with S and D, and then some other letter. 
um, that basically says it's something that you, some piece of infrastructure that you can configure via code or an interface or an API or something like that. So we did software defined networking. What does it mean? Basically, we use Cisco ACI. Uh, it's a product uh, that's, that's quite new on the market. And it basically says, forget the old fashioned or the, the old way of thinking about network. Just think about your network as applications that want to talk to each other. So what you do is you define um, applications and you define how they are allowed to talk to each other and then the rest is done by the system and you don't care. Perfect for me because I don't have any clue about network. Um, then computing was obvious for us because of naval work for us for, for a long time. Uh, we would stick to that. And then we were about the storage part, uh, Ceph. We already had Ceph running in our office environment, uh, quite a big Ceph cluster because we not only use it for, for virtual uh, disks, but also for, we have a media team that does video production and they need a lot of disk space. So we said we run that on Ceph. Uh, so we have dedicated Ceph servers in our office. So we had some experience with Ceph. Already I talked about this the last time I was here. Um, so this is the second SD part, SDS. Um, maybe some, some details, I also already said something about Cisco ACI, it's completely API driven, so the complete thing is an API and whatever else is then wrapping around this API, so you can configure your network via an API. Um, so you define these application groups, like say you have a group for a web server and you have a group for a MySQL database and then you have a group for whatever, another web server type and things like that. And then you just define contracts between them and say the web server is allowed to talk to the database and the second web server is also allowed to talk to the first one, but whatever. Yeah? So there's contracts you define and then ACI takes this contract information, this grouping information and will create routing, routing rules on the switches. So every switch is a router in the end, something like that and we'll create ACLs on the network layer. And what we do is we made it very simple for us. We just defined that every VLAN is an identifier for an EPG, that's the, uh, the, the, the group that we're talking of. So endpoint group, what it says. So if we say we want a new EPG, we just fire up the machine in a new VLAN and then it's in the own group. So Every microservice in our case has its own APG and then within this APG there may be um, a load balancer, in our case HA proxy, so this is the only, the only uh, entry point to the whole APG from the outside, so everyone that wants to talk to this microservice needs to talk to the HA proxy in front. Then we have maybe dedicated databases, could be MongoDB, MySQL, Redis, Elasticsearch, you name it, whatever else. Then you, most of the time you have synchronous application servers. They run in our case on most on JRuby. Um, we have the same stack then basically also for asynchronous workers that do asynchronous jobs. And all that is then taken together into one EPG, one network group. And the machines within the group are allowed to talk to each other but not to anybody else by default. Then we have Ceph. Uh, for um, I think most of you will know Ceph, but uh, very shortly, it's a distributed storage. It provides uh, block storage. It provides S an S3 compatible object store, and there's also a possibility to to have a file storage um, interface uh, underneath. There is there is just a lot of disks on a lot of different nodes. Um, we we chose to use Ceph because it's highly scalable. And that was the reason why we wanted to go away from, from the NetApps. They were working perfectly, but it was hard to scale them. One reason that we chose it was that it's open source. Um, and because the question was here today, we use Joule release uh, currently on our production systems. Yeah, then we have OpenNebula. Uh, for all of you that are interested in production, we currently run 5.2 only because we didn't have time to upgrade until now. Uh, in the office environment, environment we already have the 5.4 release running. Um, we have an HA solution based on coursing pacemaker and DUBD. Uh, only reason for that is that we had it in place since some years and there was no reason to change the setup. 
yeah, we use Ceph as a storage um, in both the office and the production environment and in the production environment there's still some legacy NFS shares that will fade out at the end of the month probably. Yeah, we have VLAN based networks, so we, for every microservice we create a network in OpenNebula that has, that is tied to a specific VLAN. Um, yeah, now that's, that's something the last time I uh, talked about it uh, before we used uh, DHCP based uh, IP config, so we, we created a static entry for every MAC address in OpenNebula and uh, tied an IP address to it, so we switched that to the contextualization because somebody here told me that it works and so it, it, it worked, really works so and the images are provided by Packer so. so then more a little bit more details about the hyperconverged setup so what does hyperconverged mean in that case you have a virtualization node that does that runs all the virtual machines that you have but it also has the disks inside for your storage purposes so what we have is um, at the moment, we are currently in a migration phase, migrating from the old-fashioned data center to the new data center with the new hyper-converged infrastructure. So currently, we run 30 uh, KVM nodes uh, in a hyper-converged way and 60 old-fashioned ones, I called it, uh, in the old data center. Uh, they all run on Ubuntu 16.04, depending on when we bought them. They have between 32 and 72 uh, logical cores uh, per node and somewhere between 256 and 512 gigabyte of memory. We have 10 gigabit uplinks and I also want to mention because it was the question before if we have a dedicated card for storage and the, the rest. No, we run that on the same on the same card. I can explain why or what was the, the idea behind it later. And we also something that we changed in the past, we, we booted from this, found out that it's quite expensive to just boot the system from two rate controller uh, managed disks. Um, and then we started using SD cards and they broke after the le uh, latest one year. Um, so what we do now is we pixie boot our KVM hosts. Uh, we have two environments, blue, green, so if we want to do upgrades, we create a new environment, we put a host into the new environment, see if it works, and if this one works, then we switch all the others into that environment. Yeah, what we do is we have, we have dedicated resources for Ceph on the node, because as you can imagine, if you run virtualization and storage on the same node, then this can interfere to each other. So what we did is we have systemd, um, that's the, the one good thing about systemd, it has this built-in uh, functionality to dedicate resources to a specific application. Um, would, work with, uh, would work the old-fashioned way as well, but uh, here we could directly use that. So we dedicate some CPU cores and a little bit of memory to Ceph, and the rest is then uh, dedicated for the virtualization itself. So every, every uh, pizza box, every node that we have, so it's a one head unit uh, KVM host, has one SSD for the Ceph journal and three SAS disks. So it's not that much per node. So as you can imagine, this also doesn't add too much load to the KVM host because three OSDs per, per node is fine. All in all, with a lot of KVM hosts, you get quite a big Ceph cluster, which is perfectly fine for us. So th this is how one of these hyperconverged nodes looks like. And the good thing is now, if I need to scale, I add a new KVM host and I buy it in the same time I add some more disks. So over time I don't have to think about, uh, do I have to uh, think about more storage uh, only if I have a different load, but an app for just extending the load. You know? So you just add nodes and you scale everything that's within your system. Um, and the same thing applies also for the network, I have to say, so the network is also highly scalable, uh, the, the whole Cisco ACI thing. So uh, you just add a new rack with a new switch and then it's, uh, it's more or less fine. Yeah, so what, uh, there's one thing about, about all of that, it's still three different systems. You have Ceph, you have KVM or Open Nebula, uh, you have uh, Ceph, uh, uh, sorry Ceph already, uh, you have the ACI, it's three systems and you still don't have one interface for that so we were looking uh, 
had a solution for that. We were using Chef a lot and thought, yeah, why not use Chef for that and let Chef configure everything here. But Chef is very, is very good in installing software uh, and configuring it on a single node, but it's very, very, very bad if it should install and configure software on several nodes in an, uh, in an orchestrated way. So we were looking for something else and we decided to go with Terraform. We already heard something uh, about Terraform today from Jimmy. Um, and so yeah, we also, we also wrote our own OpenAble, the Terraform provider, because there was nothing here. Um, I actually also told my, my colleagues today that they upload the, the latest version to GitHub today. So uh, as, of to, as of now, there should be the latest, uh, latest OpenAble provider uh, available in the Runtastic GitHub account if you're interested. Um, what does Terraform do in our case? It, first of all, it configures the ACI and creates, if I want to do a new application, a new service, it creates all that necessary uh, VLANs and configurations within the ACI. Then it goes to OpenAble and creates a network with exactly the same VLAN that it used in the ACI and the same uh, IP um, subnet and will do the same in OpenNebula. Then it will also go and create uh, virtual machine templates in OpenNebula, use the right networks for that. Then it will create virtual machines uh, and, and start them. Then it would at one point connect to the virtual machines and do a chef bootstrap and install whatever software is needed on that host. Um, when that is done, then it does some other stuff like updating and whatever, and it will then reboot the final time, the, uh, last time the machine and when the machine is rebooted then there is some scripts executed because you may have machines that are in a cluster like you have HA proxy in a cluster and then you need to execute some script so that the cluster, the pacemaker cluster is up and running or your MySQL or Redis and you want to do master slave configs. That's also all triggered by Terraform and um, Ceph is very easy because you just create a pool and you use it. It's the, the most easy part with OpenNebula, you just configure the few things in your data store and it's finished. Um, and that's basically how, how the whole thing works. I can, do I have still time? Uh, yeah. I can show you a little bit if you're interested. Is it, can you read that? Um, <coughs> I can show you a little bit how the whole thing looks like uh, so that you have a feeling we have, um, we have some modules, we, uh, we created some modules for Terraform. So we have modules that are able to do all the stuff in, in Chef that we need, like creating roles in Chef uh, and uh, other things that are needed. Then we have uh, modules that do the parts in, in, in the ACI. They will create the tenant or, or the endpoint group for your application. They will uh, add the VLANs and the subnets. They will create contracts between the endpoint groups. Uh, then we have, uh, have modules, that's some of the platform part for OpenNebula um, that will do all that OpenNebula stuff, creating templates, creating um, virtual machines, uh, creating images. So we can also, uh, if we say we need a persistent image for that specific database, then it will create that image. It will resize the images to whatever I need them to. Um, then we have a part for the storage. Um, and the part for services, which is a little bit of an abstraction module because we have the same service over and over again. So all our services look like have the same stack. So we created something to do that here. And, and then we, here you can see that's, that's basically all the, the services that we, that we already run or configure with Terraform. And you can see here. That's the stuff that we can do at the moment. So we can create Elasticsearch, Glassfish, um, HA Proxy, Mancache, MongoDB, MySQL, Redis, uh, Sidekick, which is a asynchronous uh, worker setup for, for, for Ruby. Um, yeah, some other stuff, Trinidad, Zookeeper. So basically what we have is a template, the user, or we can go, we can just pick the parts that we need. We just do a little bit of configuration, just adding, changing some variables on how, what's the name of the server and stuff like that. Then we do the Terraform uh, plan that we saw already today and the Terraform apply and in the end, like 10 minutes later, the whole thing is up and running. And 
if you want to scale it, we just add nodes to the whole thing uh, and we can scale up and down uh, as we like. <coughs> Yeah, so I'm coming to, uh, to the end. If you have any additional, if you need any additional info, uh, here's my email address. You can just mail me. Uh, I'm really happy to get in contact with you guys because I also want to know what you're doing. Um, so just, just uh, post me a mail. Um, if you, we also have a tech blog at Rantastic. Uh, there is quite some interesting tech articles, not only about what we are doing, also about what our developers are doing. If you're interested, just have a look. We have a GitHub account uh, where you can also find that Terraform Open Nebula provider plus several other stuff that our company is, um, is providing or doing. And if you're interested in more in the Terraform part, uh, then you can just go and there's a YouTube video that uh, about a talk that I did on that. That's it. Um, that's it. Any questions? Uh, hi, Arvin. Thanks hi. for this. Um, do you support everything yourself, or do you get uh, kind of like support from the Intel guys, or from Open Nebula team, or from Cisco team, or you handle everything internally? Uh, I mean, we obviously have support for Cisco ACI because you need to have it uh, anyways if you have a product like this because it's not open source. Um, so we have support for this, but more for the hardware side. And uh, uh, we don't have support for the rest for, for, for Open Nebula or Ceph um, because we didn't need it until now. Um, we have some support for some of our databases, but, uh, but in, that, in that area, we don't have any support. So basically grow the uh, capabilities in this uh, eight person team that you mentioned and basically uh, keep it inside. Yeah, yeah, so. Mm. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we use Terraform only for the virtual machines that run in this hyperconverged <coughs> infrastructure and for configuring the ACI, so which is also part of the hyperconverged uh, infrastructure. Ceph itself, um, there is not that much that you have to do um, because uh, there is an ans there is an, an Ansible playbook for Ceph that comes directly from Red Hat that we use to to do the configuration on Ceph part, which is uh, quite good. Uh, so in the case of we have to scale, we just run that Ansible playbook and then it's fine. Yeah, oh, but I, there is something yeah I, I didn't. I didn't mention that. That's true. Uh, okay. mm. You don't use it.